I'm Mick Garris, and this is Postmortem. And under the knife, Robert Englund, best known for seven movies and a whole TV series as Freddy Krueger. But there's a lot more to Robert than that, and we're going to dig into it now. So, Robert, I know you're a big fan of the genre. Did you choose horror, or did horror choose you? Horror chose me. Um, and actually, uh, Wes Craven, uh, early on in uh, the production of the original Nightmare on Elm Street, kind of encouraged me to respect the genre. And at some point, not too long after that, I began to, uh, I remembered that as a child, and as an adolescent, I was obsessed with horror and Lon Chaney and science fiction and staying up late every Friday and Saturday night with my friends on sleepovers and watching our favorite horror movies and discovering that whole Hollywood, you know, uh, history of horror. And I realized that I had this, it was a suppressed memory, <laughs> I think, that it really had influenced me. And so it was kind of unique that um, my biggest success has been in the horror genre. Uh, but I, I can't honestly say that, uh, you know, a, a, as a young, as a child and as, and as a young man, as a, as a teenager, I really did love it then. I was a fanboy uh, starting out. You know. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you train, did you want to be a theater actor? I did. I think, you know, I think I love movies always, and I think there might have been a real latent fantasy there. but. I was bitten by the theater acting bug so young uh, 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 in the, I was a valley boy and I was at a, a, a professional children's theater there, uh, actually on the old uh, California State University Northridge campus, which was, it was all bucolic and country then and orange groves and eucalyptus trees and this, this great old building and I, and. That's where I grew up too. Yeah, and it was wonderful, you know, I mean, we, and, and I, I, I think, Lucy and Desi lived down the street, and Olson and Johnson had a, wow. a horse stables across the street on one side. It was, it was really a wonderful time, very magical. And I, you know, I did. I, I happened to just get all the leads there, and uh, that's when I was truly uh, addicted. And I wanted. I thought I wanted to devote my life to being a stage actor back then. So you trained in the theater. You, mm -hmm. you went to CSUN here in Southern California, and then you went to Michigan and trained uh, a division of RADA, right? The Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts? I know, I, yes, I, was, I thought I was going to, to Carnaby Street, you know, <laughs> and chasing Marianne Faithful around and all that. Uh, uh, but I was disappointed, Mick, for, uh, you know, a month or so, but it was great. The entire faculty was English. Uh, we would sit around at night after, after rehearsals and after shows, and they would talk about working with with Pinter and Albert Finney and Peter O'Toole and and uh, Tom Courtney, Alan Bates, all these guys I idolized then, and I got all the gossip and stuff from 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 the tutors. I, I think that they were more relaxed being in the U.S. They were sort of channeling their inner Steve McQueen, and yes, I was sort of channeling my inner Laurence Olivier, and we kind of met in the middle, you know, over a uh, uh, vodka tonic and a little bit of marijuana late at night, and, and shared all this stuff back and forth. But it, and it, I think because it was so relaxed for them, that it was actually better. The, you know, the pressure would have been too much had I, had I been in the UK. I would have been like a yank in the RAF, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about your first film experience. I remember it was back in the in the 1970s, going to the El Cajon Theater in my neighborhood movie house and seeing Buster and Billy. Uh, and you were very memorable even then. This was your first film. Well, I, I'd spent a year here, uh, and I went on my first audition. Very nervous because I knew who this director was, Daniel Petri Sr., the original director of, of Raisin in the Sun. And uh, I, I got the role. And they, they dyed my hair for that. And because my hair is naturally curly, they wanted me to have a kind of 40s little crew cut in front. And, and so I, I, I wore Alan Arkin's hairpiece from <laughs> Catch-22. Wow. Uh, and uh, they, they put contact lenses in me because I was supposed to be this albino who dyes his hair black because he doesn't want to look like an albino. Uh, there you go. My first job, right? <laughs> As if I didn't have enough pressure on me. And the contacts were pink because albinos have pink eyes and my eyes are green and pink and green make brown. <laughs> so I didn't look like an albino anyway. And this was before the new technology. Mm -hmm. These were like uh, putting saucers in my eyes. And I said on the very first day of shooting, my very first moment on the set, 
Dan, I said, I feel like I'm crying. I have no peripheral vision. I said, I, what, can, what can we do? What can we do about this? And Daniel Petri, in all his wisdom, looked at me and said, take him out. The eyes are the windows of the soul. I don't want you looking like some doll. And I was like, God, oh, thank you, Dan. I thought, you know, I was never going to work again in, in this town, you know, as they say. And, uh, but that was, that was probably my first big experience with, with uh, effects makeup, you mm -hmm. know. And, and I, but it was a unique experience because my crew on Buster and Billy, these guys had also just finished a little movie for an unknown guy named Steven Spielberg, starring Goldie Hawn, called uh, uh, Sugar, Sugar Land, Land Express. Express. Yeah, yeah uh, shot by Vilmos Zygmunt. Right, right. But that was my crew. So I, nice was, I had start. Steven Spielberg's hand-picked crack crew all move from Texas to uh, uh, Statesboro, Georgia, and, and shoot my first film. So we were really in good hands. Yeah, you know? Really good hands. Yeah. But this, for you, it had to have been a very different experience. Acting for film is a lot different from acting on the stage. Well, you know, I think sometimes an actor just gets a bead on it off, off the script. And sometimes you can see the character in your mind's eye and everything's okay. Sometimes you're clueless and you don't know why you got the part. You're happy you did, but huh, how do they see me in this role? I had only played one Southerner before in my life. Mm -hmm. And I was typed for my first half a dozen years uh, as a Southerner in Hollywood. <laughs> but it was, I mean, I was starring with Jan Michael Vincent and Pamela Sue Martin and Henry Fonda and uh, Jeff Bridges and Sally Field and Arnold Schwarzenegger as a Southerner. So I jumped at the chance to do it, but I was going, huh? How do they, why do they see me like this? And I, now I look back and I realize there's something to my face. Uh, but I mean, I had to find that accent. And I went out one night to a, to like this old redneck bar. And I just talked in the voice I was going to use in the movie. And, and I figured if I didn't get my, my ass handed to me, <laughs> I could use that accent. And I, I made it. I was OK, you know. But uh, that was the trickiest thing for me, I think, was, was, was uh, having to, having to f deal with that accent the first time. And a lot of film acting, I think, is uh, what I call behavioral. And uh, there's that little voice going on in your head all the time that says, don't act, don't act, don't get caught acting. But that can take you as much out of a scene, you know, as being too technical or being too big mm -hmm. uh, can, can hurt your performance. So you want to try to find that happy, happy medium. I, I, you know, sometimes you can prepare too much, I think. But it, took, it takes years to learn that. And the reason you can, preparing too much can hurt you is that then if the director doesn't like it, your adjustment is much bigger mm -hmm. because you've got it, you've already set it somehow with your preparation. Yeah. Okay, well, probably the thing that brought you to people's attention first was V, I'm guessing. Uh, speaking of uh, under makeup again, uh, what was that experience like? An, a, um, an alien that malaprops, <laughs> who was supposed to have gone to somewhere in the Middle East and he got accidentally sent to Los Angeles as, as part of his alien crew. You know, what do I, what do I, I don't know. And I says, Ken, what, you know, what do, I, what do you want here? You know, wonderful Kenneth Johnson, who was sort of uh, every uh, sci-fi fan's favorite guy in the, in the 80s. And he said, Gene Wilder. And I just happened to adore Gene Wilder since he stole a scene from Warren Beatty in the back seat in Bonnie and Clyde. Right. And uh, I kind of knew what he meant then, that kind of hesitant, Mm -hmm. offbeat comedy that, that, that Gene does, that kind of neurotic thing. And I channeled it through my own persona. And uh, this was when uh, the miniseries was the great long form. You could really tell stories and take your time with oh, them. I remember. Ah, oh, yes, you, can, <laughs> you were master of that form, and it's great. And I, I still think it's the only form for some kinds of, of big novels and big stories, historical you know, stories, obviously things like the big, thick Stephen Kings, you know. You couldn't they tell the time. stand yeah. any other way. You yeah. can't tell it any other way, of course. And so this was kind of the golden a golden era of that, of miniseries and even TV movies then were, were probably do dealing with very controversial subjects, uh, especially for television back then. And there was only three networks, I think that very little cable then, there was no MTV yet. So we kind of owned uh, the night, and I went from being the face that people kind of recognized from whatever different move, whether I was killing Burt Reynolds or whether I was playing a redneck or, or whether I was the best friend in some Peter Strauss TV movie. I went from being that face you kind of recognized that you thought you went to high school with 
people finally knew my name from V. And that's a big difference. Until you have a television hit, you have no idea what recognition Absolutely. is because you're in everybody's living room. You know, and there's a, that breeds a kind of strange intimacy that it, people feel that they can come up to you, you know, on the subway, yeah. you know, and sit yeah. down next to you because they just saw you the night before or that morning yeah. and watched you in their underwear. Yeah. Well. <laughs> As opposed to hiring a babysitter and, and paying to park and standing right. in line and buying that, that movie ticket. That the theater. level yeah. of remove exactly. that you don't yeah. get Sitting in, in the dark. The intimacy of television is incredibly powerful. As successful as big movies are, the biggest successes are the, the television series that stick around forever. Mm -hmm. You know, those are amazing things.